Hello, everyone, and welcome to Call Your Hits, a Storm Riders Airsoft podcast. Thanks for joining us, everybody. This episode is being recorded in February of 2021. In the backdrop of this episode is the tabling of a new bill in uh, Canadian politics called Bill C-21. Bill C-21 is primarily targeted at tackling real steel firearms, arms trafficking, all this kind of stuff. However, there is a slight change in the bill that is targeted at replica firearms. And in Canada, historically, airsoft guns have not been considered replica firearms. They have fallen to some sort of, let's say, gray area of the law and as such have been fine to use. Replica firearms in Canada are actually prohibited devices. You can own them, uh, but you can't sell or buy or otherwise transfer their ownership. So this bill would actually make airsoft guns replica firearms and therefore prohibited. And what that means for airsoft in Canada is at this point in the game, sort of largely unknown. The bill was first read in our House of Commons on Tuesday. And in order for any bill to become law in Canada, it needs to be set, read a second time in the House of Commons and in the Senate, which is sort of sort of our higher tier of government, let's call it. And then eventually it gets royal assent. So it's not necessarily like an overnight process, but it does leave us with a fair amount of uncertainty. And we don't really know at this particular time what that will mean for us as airsofters. One thing that is clear, however, is we will still be allowed to own airsoft guns. Whether or not we're able to use them is going to be another conversation. And uh, I think it's worth noting, like, this is a process that usually takes a couple of months at minimum, uh, the process of the bill going through. As, uh, as Phil noted, this became information that the public had access to on Tuesday. It's Thursday night as we record. Uh, so there's much more up in the air right now than there is really known or well understood about what this means or even what reactions to it are going to look like. Yeah. And I mean, I even spoke to a lawyer earlier this week as well. And their reaction was very much like, well, we don't really know. It's, it's too soon right now. Plus, we don't know what modifications may be brought to the bill uh, before it gets it passed into law and all this kind of stuff. So there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of reaction and a lot of fear and anxiety, which is totally fair. Uh, but we want to let you guys know and acknowledge that this is something that's in the background for us. And we live in a democratic society. And what that means is that sometimes bills become law that not everybody agrees with. But we are law-abiding citizens, and if it turns out that it becomes illegal to play airsoft, then of course we won't be able to play airsoft anymore. And if that's a reality that happens, then we are certainly going to address that when it happens. Uh, but until then, we're you know hoping to continue making content for you guys and share our knowledge and experience and hopefully help you get more out of your play and get better in the ways that uh, you want to. And I think it's probably worth noting also that you know we have more or less chosen, not without difficulty, but we've more or less chosen to take an optimistic stance on this. You know, Airsoft has existed in a legal gray area for really the entire 15 years or so that we've been playing. And in that period, you know, it's generally curved towards being more legal, not less. Um, the legal status of Airsoft has improved over time with most sort of pieces of legal attention being brought to it uh, and governmental attention being brought to it. You know, and our plan for this episode is sort of to, to talk about that, I guess, in a lot of ways. But the equivalent to this in, you know, Ireland and in the UK, um, to use the, the easiest examples, the examples that come most readily to my mind, uh, has actually been, you know, it has been a pain for the airsoft communities there, but it has actually resulted in a clarification of the legal status of airsoft in those countries and by and large in an improvement of that legal status because the government ceases to go, well, we don't really care about these particular toy guns um, and goes, all right, well, we have to address this, so let's address it sensibly. Uh, and I do certainly feel at this point that the updates to the bill may uh, be targeting airsoft guns in the sense that they cover them, but I don't really feel like they're targeting airsoft in the sense that they've explicitly gone out of their way to try to get rid of this hobby. The replica firearm stuff is almost certainly being written sort of with an eye towards preventing people from taking an airsoft replica or any other replica firearm outside somewhere and getting in trouble with the police and having bad things happen to them. And to be clear, that is already currently illegal in Canada anyway, right? 
So I think what Pat was saying is totally astute, which is that they're likely not targeting Airsoft in particular with this bill. However, you know, it, it does so happen that as a consequence of this, they are also clarifying what it means to be a replica firearm. And I mean, the, the reality is, if the purpose of a replica firearm is to replicate what a real gun looks like, then that is exactly what Airsoft does. There is no question about that. And so, you know, from a legislative standpoint, from a legal standpoint, that I can understand why they would want to do that. But on the flip side, what was Pat was saying earlier is that we choose to remain optimistic because there are use cases for Airsoft in other countries. And some of those countries are countries that are similar to Canada in that they're, you know, a Westminster style parliament with the House of Commons and in Britain have a House of Lords, but it's basically a Senate and all this kind of stuff. So we have similar democracies with similar democratic system, and there's no reason that we couldn't have similar laws. So all that being said, we don't want to waste too much time on the like specific legalities of it, because like Pat was saying, it's currently Thursday. It's been two days. We don't know what exactly the future will entail for us. But and we are notably lacking in law degrees, which I feel we should mention there because, you know, like, yes, we did sort of off the books consult a lawyer, a friend of ours, like we didn't pay him to talk to us about it. We didn't, you know, uh, hire him to investigate this super thoroughly. So don't take anything we're saying as legal advice. <laughs> yeah, absolutely not. But I know for myself that this whole situation has definitely made me a little bit anxious, no question. But it also has gotten me to think about airsoft and what airsoft means to me and how long it's been in my life and what that represents and what you know what would be taken away from me if you were just to carve that out and say you don't get to do that anymore and in thinking about that i realized you know geez like i've been and i've said this in some of our other videos too like i've been playing airsoft for 15 years i started playing airsoft in 2006 and at that time pat and i that's probably the time in our lives when we were probably the least close like the least in contact we had our two different circle of friends and we sort of just hung out and we didn't come together a whole lot so when i started playing airsoft i didn't rope you into it immediately because we weren't really hanging out at that time a whole lot right yeah definitely um yeah, it was an unfortunate thing really uh in my life that we weren't hanging out as much as we had been but you know that was the the vagaries of the situation if you will Totally, yeah. Uh, to be clear, like, I wasn't mad at you, you weren't mad at me, it's just the people we were hanging out with different, we were in different places, and that's, you know, that happens yeah. with friends, but just like anything, totally. I mean, when we started hanging out again, it was like no time had passed, so that's fine. Mm -hmm. Which was not really the point of that comment, but it was just to say that, for me starting Airsoft, I was like, okay, I was playing paintball, I didn't really know any, anybody playing paintball, no, but none of us, uh, like, of our crew really wanted to play, so I was by myself. I was like, okay, well, Airsoft looks really cool, I'm gonna check that out, and Really, when I checked it out, I was like, okay, you know what? I don't really care if I know anybody. I'm just going to go and spend some money and I'm going to buy an airsoft gun that I think looks cool and see if we can start a community. And like, you know, like I was saying, that's 2006. It was, you know, about middle of the year. I picked up a Tokyo Marie. It was a FAMAS F1. It was very expensive because back then airsoft was very expensive. Like you, the, this whole idea of going and buying an airsoft gun for 200 bucks, like you can forget it. Like this was, I think at the time it was like, probably close on five, probably $600 when I bought that, right? It was very expensive. But I mean, it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen in my life. Like as soon as I got it, it was like, oh my God, this is amazing, right? Didn't uh, matter yeah. that the like lower part where the battery went was plastic and it was really creaky and the mags were pain to reload and like it shot so fast, you like dumped your mid caps, all this crazy stuff. But at the time, like this was my first foray into Airsoft and Truthfully, I mean, I've said it, I think, before as well. I, I don't think there was, there had any, ever been any sort of organized airsoft in Newfoundland up until that point. That we're aware of, anyway. Yeah, and I mean, <laughs> if, if by some chance there are people listening to this who are like, oh, I was doing airsoft back in 2002. Okay, fair enough. Let us know. But I, as far as I'm aware, yeah, at come least on, in, we'll talk to you. <laughs> yeah, and like, as far as I'm aware, I think in St. John's, for sure, it just never happened. We actually organized everything on the Airsoft Canada forums. We put a, a call out there and we had like 18 players that first day. Now, not, not everybody played. Some people were just interested in checking it out. I know there was one guy who was there with his dad and the, guy, the kid was in a wheelchair, but he was really interested in just checking out the gear and the guns and stuff. And I mean, you feel like such a baller when people are like, oh my God, you've got all this gear and all this kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, as we've said before, right? None of us are... Uh... None of us are doing this and aren't nerds who want to show off our stuff. Like <laughs> Totally. And I mean, at that time, I mean, in 2006, I mean, I was 22 years old, right? So like, I thought I was a hot shit, right? I thought like, man, like the sun sh like shone out of my ass, as they say. 
well, no, in retrospect, it's probably a little cringe, but anyway, that, that, that is what it is. Um, <laughs> oh, but, it's fine. Your wife will make fun of you for the pictures. Yeah. Um, I still have some of those coming. actually from like the very, very early games somewhere on like one of my like old, old hard drives probably back there somewhere. But like, anyways, yeah. Facebook like, has pictures of me from our first game. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I remember like the first game that you played, you were wearing this like really thick OD jacket, but I don't think it was like purposefully OD. Like it wasn't like a, a surplus jacket. It was just like this like big jacket you had that was like drab green. Yeah, it was, right? a, it was a researcher's field jacket that I owned um, that like it was super comfortable and had huge pockets and was OD. So it's actually ironically kind of one of the better non BDU airsoft garments I've ever owned. Yeah. Definitely was not bought with that purpose in mind. No. And I remember you used my L96 sniper at the time for that game, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Like a stock well L96 that, again, I thought was hot shit, but actually it was probably closer to hot garbage, to be honest. Uh, yeah, I mean, it definitely, uh, it definitely wasn't, especially before it got upgraded, it definitely wasn't the best gun. Let's be um, honest, though. Even after it got upgraded, it also was not the best gun. Like, let's, let's be, let's be we real. We learned a lot. Yeah. <laughs> we um, learned a lot, and that's probably the best we can say. But, I mean, I remember that you were there, and you had that, like, I don't know if you had it at the time, but you eventually, maybe it was, like, one of the first games. You had that shitty M4 vest uh, with the cross draw on it, because I why wouldn't you? That. I definitely got the shitty M4 vest after I bought the Scar. Oh, yeah, you're um, right, so you're after, right. after... After that first game, like I was, I was pretty much sold immediately. Yeah, it was hella fun. Um, you know, Phil was running a G and G Scar L. Yep. And I basically went out and was like, "All right, well, you know, Phil knows something about this shit, and there's a G and G Scar L for it was like five hundred bucks, because again, stuff was just more expensive on uh, Airsoft Canada. Someone was selling, and I was just like, "Yep, all right, gimme." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of our other friends had a cross draw vest for some reason. I remember like back in that, back in those days too, like I was really intent on being like, oh yeah, you know, I want to do the, the PMC loadout, like private military contractor loadout. And what that meant in my mind was a ball cap, a sweater, like a, a black commando sweater, you know, like those black, I, like I wool. I still have three of those and they're super comfy. <laughs> yeah. They've got like the shoulder, like the, the elbow, like reinforcements and all this kind of garbage, but, but it was the itchiest thing I ever wore. Like it was so bad, <laughs> but I mean, it looked apart. And then I threw I, on, I really liked it. <laughs> I had my like multicam pants with my boots on, uh, my like desert boots for my bottom. I had my drop leg holster with the Serpa for my, uh, at the time was probably USP 45. I had the USP 45 for a really long time. It turns out I was looking at some yeah. random like side note. I was looking at some random footage from like, uh, 2015, some games that we were playing and I'm doing like village games with my pistol and it's like, it's a USP 45. And like, that's, that was a long time because in 2008, I would have had that USP and I, I had it for like seven years. So yeah, well, I mean, you had it when, uh, when I started playing, cause the other thing that I bought when I started playing was a USP 45. Um, and remember how we had to frank right? them, gu frank and gun them together. Like mine wouldn't work and yours wouldn't work, but we swapped the slides on them and they both worked fine for some reason. Yeah, like yeah. no, uh, um, no way. To yeah. I do remember that. I also remember. Um, after I eventually swapped off of mine to uh, to the PX4, actually, um, that uh, I managed to get a hold of uh, new hop up rubbers for them, and that was just a huge pain to get at the time, like mm -hmm. it was just monstrously difficult to find. Uh, and it fixed all the issues with both of them. Yeah, <laughs> and I was like, oh well, you know, and not to be, you know, the the old airsoft are going, oh darn kids these days don't appreciate how good it is to be able to like buy a new hop up rubber. But man, it is good to be able to just buy a new hop up rubber. No kidding. And like just any <laughs> parts or guns and you know, coming back to our main topic that we started off with, like when I started playing airsoft, I had no idea whether it was really legal or not. Right? I had no idea whether I was actually uh, allowed to own this uh this airsoft gun. I had no idea whether I was allowed to transport it. I was actually constantly in fear of getting pulled over by the police with my airsoft gear in the back and then them asking to like me to open my trunk and then finding the gear and then taking it and destroying. That's that's something that I was concerned about for a long time because I didn't really know. I mean, firstly, I'm not a lawyer. I'm, you know, a young kid. I'm in my early 20s. I've had no run-ins with the loss, you know, at all. And I, I don't really know what the legality of it is. So, you know, there that was a concern initially. And then... On top of that, we weren't playing on a private field. Like, we were playing on Crown Land, right? And historically, that place had always been used for paintball. 
So for us to go up there with with guns, people just thought we were playing paintball, right? Which is I mean, fine. And in general, I think people in in our province tend to be a little bit less gun shy, right? Because there's a bit more of a gun culture here from like hunters and stuff. And there's a culture of also being part of what they call the militia, which is just being part of the reserve battalion and stuff. So if you were up in the woods and you were wearing cat pat and you had a gun, people thought, oh, he's a hunter or he's playing paintball or he's in the militia. And it's all of these are fine. Right. And it's worth noting also that, you know, that same area yeah, has been used to do orienteering sorts of work uh, or training. And um, honestly, you know, not that it's the case anymore because there are a lot more people living in sort of relative close proximity to it than there were when we started 15 years ago. You know, like when we started, people used to shoot skeet up there. Right. Yeah. And no one cared because it's a cliff. So they just overlook in the ocean the, like people. Yeah. yeah like bob, bob the skeet off the cliff, shoot the skeet. You can't do that anymore. Um, I'm not really sure it was super safe then, to be honest, but people did. And I'm sure people still do. It's just, you know, less well, common now because there's a lot more hikers and stuff like that. Same reason yeah. that we don't play airsoft as much up there because it's just, it's a bit of a pain sometimes. But when we were up there, like really, I mean, it wasn't technically legal. It was definitely tolerated. And later on, it turns out, um, you know, as we fast forward to the future, one of our frequent players became a police officer with the RNC. We, Pat and I, became friends with an RNC uh, officer who at the time was an officer. He's retired now. But these were people who, like, we had conversations with and said, hey, so this is what we're going to do. And their reactions were very much like, yeah, as police, we really do not care. We have more important shit to do. <laughs> yeah, it's like, we know you're going up there. If someone calls in a report of some guy with a gun at Redcliffe, we are not going to investigate because we know that people do that and it's safe. So just don't... Be idiots about it. You know, don't point your guns at people and try and scare them and all this kind of stupid stuff. And we never, ever had an incident with that, right? We never had a problem with like uh, people shooting at hikers, uh, either intentionally, especially intentionally, but also accidentally. Hikers never got shot by us. You know, nobody ever got injured. Like, yeah, we injured ourselves up there by like, you know, twisting an ankle and stuff, but nobody ever got hurt. So the police never really did care, right? But at the same time, was it strictly legal? Probably not. And I mean, I remember uh, looking into sort of the legality of this stuff a lot when I started playing. And when I started playing Airsoft, Airsoft existed in a bunch of simultaneous weird, really gray areas is the right term, just like in the sense of, you know, ill-defined rather than in the sense of like quasi-illegal. Mm -hmm. um, so when I started playing Airsoft, Canada Customs viewed Airsoft guns as replica firearms as an internal policy that had not been vetted or checked with anyone else and just seized and destroyed them whenever they opened a box that contained one. Mm -hmm. um, and then between then and now, there was a period where it was super cheap to order from the States and it was cheap enough that people were willing to go, well, they only open about 50% of them, whatever. You know, and then Airsoft became more popular and Airsoft subsequently became more of a thing people were aware of. Uh, and Canada Customs was just like, oh, well, if people are aware of what these are and we actually need to be educated about it, all right, fine, no problem. Yeah. Which was okay. You know, that that was a logical sort of approach, I think, for them to take of, oh, okay, well, you know, there's there's enough interest in this matter for us to actually stop what we're doing and pay attention for a minute and then invest taxpayer money in figuring out what to do about these. Yeah, exactly. And again, you know, I, there was a lot of gray area. And I, I, I don't know if it happened around 2011, but I definitely became aware of it around 2011 that the rules regarding replica firearms were modified, or at least I, I, at that time I, I became aware of it, that in order for a replica firearm to be considered a replica firearm, it, if it shot a projectile, that projectile had to shoot less than 366 feet per second or some muzzle energy, which I don't remember, 0 0.8 joules perhaps or something like that. And, and the muzzle energy thing was really, really arbitrary. And therefore... It was perfectly fine to import. It was perfectly fine to use. It was considered a, a sort of unrestricted firearm akin to like an air gun. You could own one. You could use one, however, as long as it was safe and you weren't, you know, committing a crime or using it on someone in an effort to harm them in some way. And that was that. So that made it very clear for airsoft. I can buy airsoft guns as long as they shoot over 366 feet per second. If you go to a retailer like Evike, for example, they would even show you Canada compliant, which meant that the gun was shooting above that threshold and it wouldn't get seized at the border. Now, did they still get seized occasionally? Yeah, totally, because people weren't necessarily as educated at the CBSA, the Canadian Border Services Agency, as they should have been. But that's beside the point. The, the fundamental fact was it made it very clear that you could own them. And that's when we really started to see a big uptake in Airsoft in general, because then everyone was able to order guns, stores were able to order them, and it was much cheaper to order them. 
And that's when we started seeing like our local field frontline around 2013, 2012, I think, something like that. Uh, they started having airsoft games and ordering in airsoft gear and selling airsoft gear to just about everybody um, as long as they were of age, let's say. Sort of a real boom, really. Um, yeah. Pretty much internationally, I think, in airsoft. Like it became sort of the thing for a year or two. Uh, which was super cool because we got loads and loads of new players and it was awesome. Had really big games, yeah. Like 2013, I think, maybe 2014, we had like those um, Battle of Stalingrad games, which was just like scenario games in the winter in like March at Frontline. And one of them had like 100 players, I'm positive. Oh, totally. Like it's one of these things where I don't look back on those games super fondly because February here is bitter cold and yeah. I was often doing stupid stuff like wearing desert combat boots. But they were a lot of fun. And, you know, especially for a place that has traditionally had a relatively small airsoft community, getting to play with 100 people was awesome. Yeah, like the first the first Battle of Stalingrad airsoft game that I played, uh, I think we had close on 100 players, probably maybe a, a little bit less than that. And I obviously wanted to be a commander because, listen, I'm the most experienced airsofter in St. John's. Clearly, it has to be me. That was just hubris on my part and I think just cockiness. In retrospect, that attitude was kind of shitty. But that being said, that's sort of the attitude that I took. But so now, now I had an opportunity to command up to 40 players. I had never even played a game with 40 players up until that point, <laughs> right? Let alone 40 players on one side, right? 40 or 50 players. There's that, I want to be in charge of people moment. And then it's uh, always followed by the, okay, now I'm in charge of people. What the hell do I do? Ah. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's something we sort of talked about in the past a little bit, and we may talk about in the future. But that was a, you know, a crazy, crazy experience. And I would never have experienced that, you know, if we hadn't ultimately back in 2006 decided to just jump in. But that was very much facilitated by the fact that our, our airsoft guns were very, like the law was very clear, right? There also was this weird intermittent period, and I'm sure you remember this, Pat, where Canadian airsoft guns who, or I should say airsoft guns that were sold in Canada had to have like a clear lower receiver right so yeah, like yeah. it was smoke tinted or whatever but you could just basically see oh that's not a gun there's a mech box inside there yeah um and it was this weird thing where somehow and or for some reason there were a bunch of not um clear lower guns that existed and could be bought in the community for more money if you had the money to buy them and I suspect in retrospect that a lot of those were probably just being like bought and driven aboard across the border <laughs> Yeah. In, you know, the trunk of someone's car. And it was definitely not 100% legal, let's say. I don't think the law would have borne you out on that. Oh, totally. I, I think you're absolutely correct. I don't think there was any chance in hell that you'd have, sort of air quotes, been okay. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you were buying from a retailer in Canada, for the most part, you were buying, you know, and again, like paying $600 or $500 for a, uh, a classic army rifle that had had the metal lower replaced with a transparent smoked plastic one mm -hmm. um, for no benefit whatsoever other than to accommodate some sort of regulation. Um, and I'm not even really sure what the regulation was or where it came from. Yeah, me either. Um, and that's, that's sort of what I mean by like this hobby having existed in more than one gray area at once, right? Because you have simultaneously at around that time, you know, Canada Customs has a view on what constitutes an airsoft gun and what you can bring into the country. The RCMP has a view on uh, what they are, what you can do with them, and when and where. Um, and for viewers who aren't from Canada, that's the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, so our federal police agency. Local policing and government often has their own view on it. And the government, the federal government, has no official policy whatsoever. So you're like, what are these legally and what may I do with them? And that's where, you know, when we said at the start, like, it's not clear what will or will not happen. Because like you were saying, like, all these different law enforcement agencies, like the RCMP and the, the our, you know, Royal Newfoundland Constabulary, which is our provincial police. It's one thing for there to be a law for or against something. But the other question is, do they even care? And as we said before, when we played Airsoft years and years ago, when we first started, it certainly wasn't fully legal in the way that it is right right this, this second. Yeah, but absolutely. the police didn't care because it's harmless, right? The point of a lot of these gun laws is to keep guns out of the hands of criminals. And whether or not that's effective is not at all the, the purpose of this podcast. But it, it just matters whether or not the police is really concerned about enforcing these particular laws, especially as airsoft is, is concerned. And 
We don't know what that's going to look like. And quite frankly, I mean, it's possible that by the time you listen to this podcast, the bill will have been modified and changed as a result of lobbying and all this kind of stuff. So who knows? We do know that, um, you know, both sort of airsoft is on the, you know, everyone who plays level and businesses that are going, hey, man, you know, we're a small business. Uh, We're doing pretty okay. We don't want to lose our revenue stream are all approaching the government from various angles and going, hey, there really isn't any reason for you to make these things illegal. Please stop. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I'm, I'm optimistic. I, th- I think that there's a reasonable chance that those voices will be heard and that the, uh, the bill will be modified either before or after the fact. Yeah. And I think part of the retrospective piece too is also recognizing that things have changed over time. Chain- things were not always the way that they are now. And they, all, they are not necessarily always going to be this way either. The state of our sport has been in flux for a really long time, and what Airsoft looks like has changed you know, dramatically over the years. I mean, if you think about how we play today, I mean, we primarily go to frontline and we play open games and random matches for a couple of hours uh, here or there. And then Frontline also has like a, the outdoor open, the indoor open. So some players are out there playing twice a week. Well, pre-COVID, obviously, because right now we're like confined and uh, we're right now, remotely right now we're recording in- this podcast. <laughs> Yeah, right now we're in lockdown and, uh, you know, recording from different locations, which is not our usual. Thinking back to that Stalingrad game, like, that was when we really decided to... Well, maybe not actually. You know what? I, I'm thinking back. When, when we, we played that scenario that you ran, Operation Asgardian Chill, perhaps, yep. I think is what yep. it was called. Yep, and that was the one where it was, like, Team Spectre, and it was, like, um, the few of us with a couple of more randoms. Uh, against like a larger force and we were just highly mobile had to go and like do a couple of different objectives and that's when myself and cal played along with um mark and jason yep and we had callum i think at the time yeah uh, who was who was random and there was was there someone else on our team Uh, or was it just the five of us maybe ryan or carol yeah maybe one of those two guys but so when we played, yeah, I think it must have been because when we finished the game, we were, I was like, okay, to Cal, like, we need to talk to Mark and Jason and have them join us, join our team. Yeah, Because yeah. Well, prior, I mean, prior to that, like, off, it, was, it was just us and Cal. Right? Yeah, that's right. It was just you, me, and Cal, and it was like that for years, and that was fine. But after that game, we were like, oh, yeah, so we need to recruit Jason and we need to recruit Mark. And they also had a third friend, Mario, and Mario was great too. And so we're like, all right, well, you guys are playing together. You're playing with us now and like join the team. And that's when we really started to, to expand the team at that time. And those, those were really interesting times. And then shortly after that, that's when we ended up playing the Stalingrad game, perhaps a little bit later on that year, maybe the year after. I'm not, I can't quite recall. I think sort of, we picked up, we picked up those three guys in like the fall, like during the fall season. Yeah. And then we went and played... That, yeah, the Stalingrad game that winter and ended up with Chris and... Um... Miles. Miles. Yeah, because yeah. that's when... it was. I remember that like very fondly because like Miles, uh, he was like in the Canadian forces as a, as, a, as a reserve member in the infantry. And he was like, a, at the time, he was either... A, I think he was a master corporal. He'd done but... his officer qualification stuff by then, hadn't he? Oh, he could he ended up because he ended up. Oh, being, yes, you're right. He he had done his his officer qual and he was second lieutenant at the time. Yeah, because he ended up being the uh, CO for that operate for the for one of the teams for that office. <laughs> we were like, oh my god, you actually know how to organize people? Get on our team. Yeah, and he kept calling <laughs> me sir, and like I remember, he's like, all right, so uh, he took a bunch of guys and he's like, all right, we're gonna orient the mat to the ground. He put it on the ground. He oriented it like to the terrain, and I was like. Dude is like legit. And he kept calling me sir, which is like the weirdest thing in the world. Cause like, why? I'm just some civilian douchebag. Like you don't, but anyways, <laughs> I thought it was cool. And cause, it, cause it's baked in, right? He's, you know, at that point he's like, yeah, you just, you're, <laughs> you're in charge. Officer. I'm going to call you sir. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're the guy in charge. So I'll call you sir. Cause otherwise I get in shit. <laughs> but yeah. So, so we did that and you know, that's when we, at that time the team had eight players and that was great. Uh, and it's funny. They also, that game, Jason Little also played. And we didn't recruit him to the team because I don't think he was really interested in playing much. But it turns out we ended up recruiting him later on, although he's never really played many games with us since then because of COVID and life and all this kind of stuff. But anyways, point is, but yeah, no, I, I remember those days. And that's, that is just at the cusp of when Frontline started really bringing in a lot of guns and was able to, to acquire a lot of like, you know, th- the typical like, you know, crappy, like, well, not necessarily crappy. It was just the typical like entry level stuff, like your G&G combat machines and Raiders 
Um, yep. They had some well, they, maybe they some up, SEMAs or think, something like I that. I think they end up sort of with a retailer reseller deal with uh, e-bike. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, so yeah. they were able to get a lot of stuff. But actually, no, they started. Yeah, no, they started out with just like a retailer agreement with GNG, and yeah. so they were getting in like the cheap side of GNG stuff, and occasionally would get in something fancier or you know you could be like hey i want a scar and they'd be like okay it'll be really expensive but you can have one <laughs> yeah and i remember like some of the guys who used to work at frontline used to also play um not going to name any names but like they'd come out with like these huge gigantic guns that they'd ordered because they they had access to the order form they knew they were going to sell them because they were going to buy them so they would just put them on there and then you see guys like roll up the field like giant machine guns and stuff anyways that's a different well, conversation but I mean, like it's also yeah. worth doing it. I mean, those guys had a hell of a lot of fun with those guns, mm-hmm. right? You know, and like, I mean, if you work at the place that's doing the ordering and you get a, a discount that's enough to make the the unreasonable airsoft gun that you think is really cool reasonable. Yeah, and it's funny <laughs> because like when, when I started playing airsoft back, back in my day, like that would be unheard of. Like it would just not be possible, right? You would never, you would never, you would never find one for one. Uh, and you'd never be able to get it in. It's just not, it was not possible. And so in the span of like, really, when you think about it, in the span of like six or seven years, you went from just scraping the barrel with whatever you could sort of find here or there to just this like surplus of of airsoft guns. In fact, you know, that's one of the things, the issues that retailers had across the world, not just in Newfoundland, is that they had way more airsoft guns that they knew what they do with. And I think Frontline certainly suffered from that too. Like they just had like massive inventory they couldn't move, right? Yeah, well, like you can you can go watch the, um, you know, various YouTube videos from then about sort of what they refer to as the airsoft bubble, where basically, like I said, airsoft had become, had gone sort of viral. It had become the cool thing to do for a year. And companies, as often happens when you get weird little economic bubbles, have just been like, oh, yeah, we're going to get more and more and more and more stuff. Uh, And so for like a few months, uh, maybe even a year there after the bubble sort of air quotes burst, you could uh, you could buy like a G&G Raider for $100. And the companies that had brought them into Canada were like, yeah, we paid $100 for it, but we can't just keep it in a warehouse like we we have to get it out of the space that we're paying for so that we can at least decrease the space we're paying for. Yeah. And in Newfoundland, uh, you know, everything is sort of delayed. Like we always say there's a joke, like everything happens half an hour later in Newfoundland because we have our, like our separate Newfoundland time zone. But what, what I mean by that is we live on an Island. And so everything is sort of delayed happening here. So that bubble burst on the mainland. And then two years later, we had that same effect here where people are, 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 you know, the bubble is actually bursting for us as well. And also because Airsoft took two years longer to get here in the first place, right? Yeah, so, right. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. And it's it's this weird thing where I remember sort of going to sell a gun because I was switching to another gun, um, as is <laughs> the, the great commercial wheel of Airsoft, you know, and going, oh man, like I paid $600 for this, uh, for this rifle and it's now worth $350 or $4. Um, yeah. Just because the, the market had fallen really sharply. And also because even after the market fell sharply, it was just easier to get stuff, right? So, you know, when we got those G&G scares, they were expensive. Uh, And part of the reason they were expensive is that they were not smoke blowers. They were, you know... Full uh, metal. Yeah, they were full metal. They were opaque. They were, you know, nice, non-trivially expensive guns. And that was the case. And then you know, for a couple of years that stayed the case. And then it became super, super easy to get everything. And I remember it being a huge upside to me because I could order, um, and I did order my, uh, my classic army M16 that I replaced the scar with, uh, brand new. And I was like, Oh my God, I can order an airsoft gun. And it's actually going to come from a manufacturer in a box. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, it won't have been in some guy's house for, here's a fun really fact do. about me. I have never in my entire airsoft career, owned a brand new airsoft gun never all the guns that i have ever owned were secondhand in some way some of them might have been brand new in that the person like when i bought my scar it was brand new in the sense that the guy probably put like a hundred rounds through it but he had bought a whole bunch and he was just like you know what i'm just gonna sell because again at that time getting airsoft guns was difficult so he had bought like three hoping that only one or two or not hoping but thinking only one or two might get through and the third one wouldn't and they had so he had a surplus and anyways point is it was not new somebody else had owned it before me i've never ever owned a brand new gun like straight from the manufacturer it's never happened That's now funny. 
the one the gun I'm using now, my GMP uh, M4 Mots, dude barely used it. So it might as well be brand new, but it, it's still not, right? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it's funny because, I mean, saying that, the only guns I've owned brand new were my PX4 and my Glock, um, both because I was just like, hey, I can get Murray pistols, give me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and that M16, um, everything else has either been like a modification off of something or... Well, yes, actually, that's technically not true because I bought the uh, the King Arms M4 that evolved into my current gun that I took apart and kept some parts of to use as the base for my current gun. I did buy that new. Look at you, big spender. Um, um, I mean, one of the uh, the dark secret, I guess, not even one of the dark secret of my airsoft career is before I started building my current historical kit that I'm working on, I had not put money into airsoft. Uh, since I sold the P90, or since I bought the P90. I sold the SCAR and it paid for the M16. Uh, I sold the P90 and it paid for just like kit at random. Uh, and everything else I bought, I paid for by doing gun tech work. Yeah. You know, I think at the end of the day, what we really wanted to, to leave you all with is that in talking about like the retrospective stuff that we were talking about and just having a conversation about the good old days or whatever, however you want to say it, Airsoft today... <laughs> is not the same for us as it was five years ago, nor 10, nor 15. And things do change, even though on the day-to-day, -day, they might not seem like they do because we're so zoomed in, so to speak. But the reality is that at the end of the day, things do change. And so even if the worst were to come to pass and Airsoft would be completely banned in Canada, that doesn't mean that someday things couldn't change in the other direction. So Absolutely. until we learn more, and maybe this episode of this podcast will not age very well. And if it doesn't, <laughs> well, then we can all have a quick, uh, we can all have a laugh about it. But until we know more, I think it's good to be optimistic, to not worry too much, not to have too much anxiety about everything. And insofar as it's possible, just the law has not changed yet for us in Canada. So we're going to keep playing yourself the way we always have for the last several years. And if things do change down the line, well, then we will adapt and, of course, be law-abiding citizens, uh, as we recommend everybody else in Canada do uh, be as well. And I think, for me, I want to leave off with the notion that this is going to take a while to go through all of the process that gets it made into a law, even if it comes out exactly as it currently is. So I think there's a reasonable chance that we'll be into sort of spring and summer before it's in anyway. Uh, so once the weather clears up and you can actually go out and get a game, take this as an incentive to go enjoy the sport and the hobby and the company and everyone while you can. Mm -hmm, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, revel in it while you got it because it there is a possibility that it's going away. But don't freak out. Don't sell all your guns. Don't toss your guns in, your, in the garbage uh, unless you own a classic army uh, 249, in which case sell it to me cheaply <laughs> um, <laughs> for no reason other than my desire to mess around with one. But yeah, no, be sensible. Yeah. So guys, thanks so much for listening. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to listen to Pat and I ramble on. We recommend you check out our Discord. Uh, it's an opportunity for you to connect with us and have a conversation, chat about all kinds of stuff, share your Airsoft memes, play some video games, whatever you want to do. So check us out on Discord, uh, the link you can find on our YouTube channel. Again, thanks so much for checking us out and we'll talk to you next time. Cheers, guys. Have a good week.